Hello and welcome to the thermodynamics module lecture number eight. Uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, ideal gases. Uh, the opening statement, uh, pr uh, important statement, uh, is Avogadro's principle, which states that equal volumes of gas at equal temperatures and pressures contain the same number of molecules. Essentially saying that it doesn't really matter about the size of the molecule, uh, when one thinks of a gas, the space in between molecules is very large compared to the size of the molecule. So if we substituted uh, one set of gas molecules for another, it, essentially the behaviour of that gas would not change. Um, so we find that we can apply very simple relationships, uh, equations of state, if you like, uh, for a large range of gases over a, a, large, a large range of temperature, pressure and volume. With our vapours, we have to tabulate, and we do tabulate for gases as well, this is for certain. Uh, but we also find we've got uh, some simple relationships we can apply over a large range, as I say, of uh, properties. Um, and also we find, when we look at the ideal gas law, which is the state equation, uh, there's different forms of that gas law. Uh, that appear and uh, they're all essentially the same thing and I just want to connect them all up first thing uh, to get that out the road before we have a look at the subject. Uh, so the first one I'm going to talk about is this one, PV is equal to N, well PV is NKT. So pressure, volume as, as we know and temperature of course, thermodynamic temperature. We haven't yet looked at the proper definition of that yet. We will do when we get to the second law. Uh, N is the number of molecules. So a number of molecules or a number of particles if you like. And K is Boltzmann's constant. So K is equal to um, well 1.38 is a few of a digits uh, times 10 to the minus 23 uh, joules uh, per Kelvin. So that's the units for, for Boltzmann's constant. This is Boltzmann's constant. Uh, well, this particular form of the, of the, uh, of the uh, ideal gas law uh, connects up quite nicely microscopic and macroscopic. Uh, but we have very large numbers, and of course the N uh, it's very big here, and the K, of course, is, is very small. Uh, so it's not ideal uh, for, uh, for uh, engineers. So we tend not to use this form. So it's a slightly different form, uh, which we can do. We can define uh, something called a mole. Uh, so one mole, one mole. Uh, of gas, and this is really tend to be used by chemists in chemistry. Uh, contains um, contains the same number of particles. As 12 grams of carbon 12. Carbon 12, usually written something like that. Uh, so 12, and that number, uh, that number is, uh, uh, well, it's 6, it's 6 0 2, 2 times 10 to the 23. Uh, uh, so the number is 6. So the number of molecules, the number of particles, 6.22 times 10 to the 23. Uh, and this gives rise to uh, Avogadro's constant, which we call Na, which is 6.2 times 10 to the 23 mole to the minus one. So, um, so the number of particles, or number of, as I said, it doesn't, tend to make any difference, to be quite honest, uh, what the gas is uh, via Avogadro's principle. Um, but uh, specifying 12 grams of carbon 12 
um, we find that the number of particles is 6.2022 to have 23 is a massive number, of course. Uh, and then we define N then for an app for, for that's for one mole. And so for an arbitrary gas, we find that N, N the number of moles, uh, is equal to uh, the number of particles, number of molecules divided by Na. This is how we define it. So, so this is clearly this is a smaller number than the, this n. Uh, you divide through by a very large number here. This is a big number. This is a big number. So this is now become a reasonable number. So what we can do, we can come to this formula here and say, okay, well now we know that n is equal to the number of moles times Na. So the number of moles, the mole is the amount of uh, the amount of uh, stuff, if you like. Uh, that's what it, uh, that's what it gives you. Um, and we can find from it, of course, with the uh, with the number of moles given, uh, we can with Avogadro's constant given, we can find out the number of molecules if you so wish to have that uh, thing there. But what we can do, we can substitute this n into there and we get pv pv is equal to n uh, so and i'll put that in brackets na uh, k times t and that's usually written and now i'm going to write it as n uh, squiggly r t um, so, and if you multiply these two numbers together, then you've got 6.022 to 3, you've got 1.38 times to the minus 3, that there's going to be some cancellation there, as you can see. Uh, you'll find then that the R, the R, this is a, a lot of people will know this number. Uh, so this is 8.3145. Uh, well, the, way I, the units I tend to use uh, is kilojoules per kilomole K. The kilojoules per kilomole K. You can joules per mole K as well. It's both the same thing. Uh, so that's the units um, I tend to use for, which I would use for R. Uh, kilojoules is what we've been using on the course. So, but you can have it as, as joules per mole as well. Uh, so at 8.314, uh, and this is called the universal gas constant. So R is the universal gas constant so that's quite a, so that's quite a convenient so let's just write the formula up again it's pv is equal to n r t so that is a quite a convenient formula then uh, used in chemistry a lot certainly um, and you know this is the wherever the gas is this 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 uh, is the same number um, uh, and these are, you know, reasonable numbers now, and no uh, large, very large numbers and very small numbers involved. So that's quite a nice, a nice formula. As engineers, we're often interested in using mass rather than the moles. We are, we do use moles as well in combustion and things like that. And you'll you'll use that on your course. N is very very uh, convenient for moles. Is a very convenient for. Uh, when you're using, um, when you've got um, chemical reactions, this type of thing, and you've got chemical formulas, it's a, it's a nice form to use there. Uh, but for a lot of stuff we're interested in, uh, certainly this module, we're interested in mass. Uh, so to get to the mass, um, we define something called the molecular weight, uh, or the relative molecular mass is probably now called, uh, though some people still don't use that. Uh, so the molecular weight called m omega, it's a dimensionless number, uh, which is the mass of a molecule, mass of a molecule over one twelfth the mass of carbon twelve. Uh, so this is just a way it's dimensionless mass mass on the top so it is um, and we also have a, 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 another number which is the molar mass which is the same numerical value as this uh, the molar mass which is equal to so molar mass let's put this one down which is equal to 
uh, the mass over the number, well, let's call it M, which is equal to the mass over the number of moles. So that's a nice convenient formula. So the mass over the number of moles is equal to the molar mass, and it gives you essentially the same number as your molecular weight. Uh, so this thing can be used to, because I've got it in there, and I've got, I've got my mass now, I'm interested in the mass. Uh, what I can do then is rewrite this equation, and that gives me that N is equal to uh, M over big M. Yes, so the mass of my gas divided by the molar mass. Uh, well, what I can do then is substitute in and rearrange this formula again. So PV, let's have a look at this one. PV is equal to, get rid of the N there, we get M. And I've got a squiggly R, let's write it like this, over the big M, the molar mass, you, uh, multiplied by P. And this one we write as M and just the ordinary R, T. So M, R, T. Uh, and the R is called the characteristic gas constant. So this R is the characteristic gas constant. Characteristic gas constant, which changes depending on the gas, of course. Uh, but you can find it, of course, by knowing the R value. Uh, which we do know, the universal gas constant, we know, uh, if you know the molar mass, uh, usually these are tabulated, uh, you know, oxygen gas, uh, 32, things like hydrogen gas, 2, and this these type of numbers, uh, carbon 12, 12, of course, um, and you get these numbers, uh, then you can substitute them in, and you can work out your type of gas constant. We tend to use this form. Uh, PV equals MRT. Uh, if you divide through by V, uh, divide through by the V, uh, then, um, then uh, well, well, if you divide through by the V, you get P is equal to M over V uh, RT. And that is density, of course, isn't it? That's the density of the gas, that thing there. So P equals rho RT, so that's another form. If you divide through by the mass, then you get P V over M. Now this one's the one that we're after, uh, which is specific volume, of course. So that's equal to P V equals RT. So that form is particularly particularly useful uh, for us. It's very convenient. Um, quite often the, even the R's are, uh, you can find in the in the tables, even for mixtures. You can use this for mixtures. We'll mention mixtures a little bit later on. Uh, rather than just pure gases. I'm just thinking of pure gases at the moment. So oxygen, hydrogen, but air is, a, is, is not pure. Um, uh, but we can still find a, an R value for air uh, using the mean molar mass uh, and using the exact same equation, it turns out. We can still use, um, we can still use this, um, this formula, just that we have to think of a different M value um, for, a, for a mixture, which is so it's a, bit, that's a bit different. Okay, so these are essentially all I've wrote, written here are the different forms for the ideal gas law. Uh, and you've probably been exposed to one or two of them. Uh, and um, so I thought I'd just bring them all together. Say, well, look, these are all the forms. They're all the same thing. There's no difference. I'm just redefining certain definitions, uh, certain quantities. Uh, so we've got the macroscopic, microscopic form of the gas. We've then got the molar form of that law, which is uh, PV equals NRT, where the universal gas, gas constant comes in. So when you see the N molar, you, you know that this is the universal one. And then we've got more used in engineers. We bring in the, uh, uh, the characteristic form. 
So PV equals MRT, and this simplifies uh, depending on what your focus is on density or specific volume. This tends to be the one we're interested in. PV equals RT, where we've got a characteristic gas law, which changes depending on the gas. Um, but we, with the universal one known, we can uh, we can find it. Um, the units for the units for R, of course, uh, units for R are kilojoules per kilogram K. So this is the units for uh, for R. Uh, you can figure it out, of course, uh, uh, fairly uh, fairly straightforwardly. Um, uh, or, or joules per gram K, but I tend to use the kilo. I always put it. Uh, most of these things are built up in terms of grams, as we as we as we notice. But they end up as ratios, so you can always introduce a kilo at the top of the bottom, and it makes no difference to the to the to the numbers. Uh, so kilojoules per kilogram K is the uh, is the units for the gas constant uh, for the characteristic gas constant. Uh, when we're talking about the universal one, it's kilojoules per kilomole K. So that's where the mole comes into it uh, in that case. Well, this is the this is our equation of state for hydrogen gas plants. There were loads of glass, gases, uh, provided the uh, the density doesn't be, the pressures don't become too great. It works. Uh, so usually we talk about the rarefied gases, uh, but um, it's, it does it does cover quite a large range. Um, but of course, it can break down. Uh, it is, it is an equation square. There are other equations of state that try to fix this uh, breakage. Um, in particular, uh, at the critical point, we mentioned the critical point uh, in our vapours. You find that very close to there, you, this thing will get you nowhere. It's, uh, it doesn't work at all. So uh, well away from that, you, you, you do quite well with this, uh, with this particular law. Uh, and we, it's used all the time. So, and it's our, the law that we're going to use on this course for gases, uh, anyway. Well, interesting thing about this is uh, once we've got an equation of state, um, and it is, as you notice, it's a, it's a, it's a, it obeys the two property rule. You'll notice that is, I'm, I'm basically saying that pressure is a function of volume and temperature so that's the two property rule or temperature is a function of pressure and volume or specific volume doesn't matter um uh our volume is a function of temperature and pressure it's, it's the two property rule that's been applied there uh, but what we're interested in of course is other properties um, uh, and one of the other properties that's a really interesting of course is energy and entropy uh, and well entropy of course but enthalpy uh, these other properties are of interest to us and the question that's of interest then is uh, can this can this equation state that you've adopted apply to gas tell you anything about uh, the other properties uh, this argument that we we argued that well if you know two properties then you know all the rest or uh, the, it's just suggesting that there's it's going to tell you something about them uh, okay so what, what, I, what I want to do uh, well what I want to do is just look at some evidence that uh, that the ideal gas the internal energy uh, and the enthalpy for ideal gas is a function of temperature only. Um, and you can prove it. You can prove it using the fact that you've got the equation of state as given by any one of these, uh, that you can prove that. It, uh, that uh, we know that temperature is important when it comes to defining internal energy and enthalpy. Uh, for a gas, it turns out to be the only thing that's important. Uh, that the pressure will not affect the internal energy uh, of an ideal gas, uh, uh, that it can't be said for vapour and other substances. Uh, but for an ideal gas, it turns out to be the case. Uh, now, I'm, I will prove it on the course. It comes a bit later when we do an entropy. But there is some evidence to su suggest it, and there were some experiments done, which I, which I want to mention, um, the experiment evidence to show that... Um, that our U values and our H values only depend on temperature. Uh, and then what we want to do, once we've got that sorted, we want to look at our specific heats. But remember that the way we got to the actual values of energy um, uh, and enthalpy was that we had this specific heat capacities, uh, which... Uh, which we tabulated, of course, 
uh, mainly tabulated <coughs> and we'll see some relationships uh, in them. Uh, one of the things that we're going to find in fact on a gas uh, the, spe the specific heats CP and CV are not the same uh, but their difference tends to be fixed which is really quite interesting. Um, in liquid CP and CV are actually the same value they don't, there's no distinction uh, between them and that's because the liquid is incompressible so uh, it's quite insensitive uh, to pressure uh, so you tend to find that the specific heat capacity uh, CP and CV are essentially the same value uh, we make no distinction there uh, but for gas we can't we certainly can't do that for gas the, the, it does matter uh, so let's have a look at uh, this evidence evidence for Uh, for well, what we evidence for this? This is what we're doing. U of t uh, and h of t. The argument uh, that internal intrinsic internal energy is only a function of temperature. Uh, or we can we also do it as u of t as well. A little um, little h of t as well. Usually specific values of more interesting so we have the first one is a um, Joule's experiment let's have a look what he, what he did uh, well what he did he uh, he took uh, contained a gas and uh, he uh, separated by a valve he had a he had a container like that And he had a valve here, so, and he had another container where he created a vacuum. So he had the gas here, ideal gas was in here, in this part of the container, and this was a vacuum. He surrounded this in a, in a bath, uh, a liquid. Um, well, just let's put it like that. So, a bath of liquid, and he monitored the temperature with thermocouples uh, in this thing. Uh, so, this is a bath. Uh, so, he had his gas in here. The whole thing had settled down. Whatever before he started the experiment, everything was was uh, settled. Um, and what we can imagine is. Um, uh, a system, uh, well our system is going to contain the gas but also we're going to change the, the vacuum because that isn't, my, well, it's not a problem there. So our total system, you can imagine it's containing the gas uh, and the and the vacuum itself. And then of course you open the valve, uh, wait till, uh, to see what happened. But what he noted when he did this experiment was that uh, there wasn't a change in temperature. You could, you could, this is a bath of water, and he, he, uh, he could not de de detect any change in temperature in the bath. Um, now, we can analyze this. We can analyze this using our closed system. It's a closed system, after all. Um, um, and we have our first law uh, of uh, thermodynamics. Uh, so, and what we have is that, uh, so we've got state one, uh, it was at one side, then it went to, opened up and it filled up, and we've got state two. Um, and our law, remember it, is, is this, this law is that U2 minus U1 is equal to Q12 uh, uh, minus W12. This is our law, wasn't it? In uh, in different in difference form, was given by this equation, which I am applying to this thing now. Uh, between its two states, one when it's in it's it's the gas is inside it it's at a big given temperature, it's at the temperature of the bath, of course, uh, wherever the initial temperature of the bath is, and uh, at the end, uh, it we it moves into the vacuum, and we noted the temperature there. And he noted that it didn't change. Now, during the process of this expansion, there's no resistance. When you open, uh, when you do work, 
uh, it has to be resisted, you know, um, you, you're overcoming some something, aren't you? It's uh, uh, or you're lifting a weight or something like that. Uh, this is unresisted, so there's no work involved in this when you go from one step to the next. So this must be this is zero for that process. The argument here is, of course, that uh, there can't be any transfer. Um, the reason there's no heat transfer, if there was heat transfer, then uh, then uh, the temperature would change in the, in the bath. So there can't be any heat transfer. That was the argument. Uh, well, what we can see, uh, what has changed in this thing is that the volume has changed and the pressure has changed. Uh, that's for sure because uh, it's, you know, uh, we've got our gas law after all, um, which uh, for ideal gases, that does tell us, you know, if you change the, uh, the volume and pressure, uh, change the volume, if, well, the temperature means to say that the volume definitely changes, but certainly the volume changes clearly. Uh, it's occupying a much bigger region now, and, and, and uh, the pressure will have changed. Uh, but the temperature can have changed. If the temperature had changed, then uh, heat transfer would take place. This is a, you know, what drives heat transfer, of course, is that uh, temperature difference. Uh, so the argument, Joule argued that it must be the case. This implied that, um, well, it tells us that U2 is equal to U1. That's for sure. It's the, the internal energy has not changed in this thing. And the temperature has not changed either, that T2 is equal to T1. And one can deduce from this that uh, U is a function of temperature only. I mean, uh, we know the pressure's change, the volume's change, and our gas law, as we have with uh, PV is equal to um, MRT, or, uh, well, let's do that one, yeah. It's the same mass, after all. PV equals MRT. Uh, and what we're finding, what we're saying is that uh, what's going on in, in, in this, this equation to apply for the same mass of gas uh, temperature doesn't change, this is all constant. And clearly the volume's changing, the pressure's changing, that's for sure. Uh, but the temperature does not change. Um, and we deduce, therefore, do, given our two property rule, we know that uh, U is a function of something, uh, but U hasn't changed. Uh, we deduce in that U must be a function of temperature. Uh, function of temperature only. Um, and that makes sense because temperature doesn't change and energy doesn't change, yes? So uh, if it's a function of temperature and pressure, well, then pressure's changed um, and you would change accordingly. So um, so it's, it cannot be a function of pressure. So this is the conclusion uh, from, uh, from Joule's uh, uh, experiment. Also, another experiment was done. This is, the, again, with Joule. So the Joule Thompson. Joule Thompson uh, experiment. Thompson was later called uh, Lord Kelvin, uh, so famous for the uh, the uh, temperature scale, of course. Uh, he was the chap that showed that uh, how the scale was independent of the materials. A lot of temperature measurements are all done with thermometric properties, that is, you measure you related to something else, mercury rising in a, in a, in a, a, uh, from a bowl uh, up a stem, uh, expansion of mercury of temperature, this type of thing, and it's, that is relating the temperature to some other property. Uh, uh, Kelvin was the guy that showed, well, actually, you can define a scale without relating to any property, uh, which we'll get on to. Anyway, the Joule Thompson experiment, very, we've looked at this already. This was... Um, uh, a throttling process, and what he did, he put a, a porous plug, a plug, uh, so a porous plug, and porous plug, porous plug, uh, and gas was allowed to go pump through this thing. And we can, again, look at our control volumes, this type of thing, can't we? There's our control volume uh, for our porous plug. And what he did, he measured the, at the exit and entrance, he measured the temperature of this thing. Um, 
And what you found with this thing, uh, at, so this is at state one, let's call that state one, at state one, at state two, uh, looking at the pressure, you measure the pressure as well, and there's a big pressure drop. So this is floor, this is M dot coming in, uh, M dot coming in, um, and uh, there's a big pressure drop. So P2 uh, significantly less than uh, P1. So a big pressure drop across the porous plug. Uh, so it's a throttling process. It's just a different way of achieving it using the porous material. Um, and he found, however, that he found when he looked at this that T2 was equal to T1. This is what he found. And he measured the temperature, the temperature across an ideal gas, this. So this is my ideal gas. Uh, this is being, what's been pumped through here. Uh, it's an ideal gas, uh, and you discovered that the temperature uh, was not the same. Well, of course, we've analysed this case already, have we not? Uh, and we came to the conclusion that this uh, device, the throttling process, was isenthalpic. Yes, um, that, that was our, uh, we used the steady flow energy equation. Uh, to, to do this, so you might recall it was H2 uh, minus H1 is equal to Q, uh, Q um, minus uh, WS. So that's our shaft work, wasn't it? This is what we, this is this equation. We've just been talking about it. Uh, we divide it through by the M dot, of course, to get these. This is, so this is the heat uh, per unit kilogram of mass flowing. Um, and we mentioned last time that this is essentially an adiabatic thing, uh, an adiabatic process. Uh, so there's no, no heat, well, very little heat loss. There's certainly no shaft work, yes. And we concluded that H1 was equal to H2, that the enthalpy across the plug uh, does not change. Well, what is changing, of course, is the uh, it's a gas. Again, we've got our gas law. Uh, we find that the temperature is the same, uh, but the pressure is dropping and the volume is the volume's changing. Uh, so according to this law. Uh, so things are changing and things are not changing. The two things that are not changing are the temperature and the enthalpy. And the use from that, that specific enthalpy then, must be a function of uh, temperature only. Uh, that's the, that was his conclusion. Uh, so again, experimental evidence, admittedly, uh, but leading to the the idea that uh, if you look at the internal uh, energies that are going on, the enthalpy and the intrinsic internal energy, then they're a function of temperature only. Uh, in fact, we could have used used it, I think, from this uh, because uh, we know that h. Well, you can I, I wrote that as big U. We can write this little U and divide through by the mass. Um, uh, let's do that way. So we know that H is equal to U plus PV, yes. Uh, but for a gas, our gas law, we can write it in this form, can't we? We've got that form. PV was RT, U plus RT. From this experiment, divided by the mass, we found that little U is a function of temperature. This is really temperature. So that must be only a function of temperature, yes. So this is implying that H of T, isn't it? H of T, H is a function of temperature, equals U of T uh, plus RT as a constant, characteristic gas constant. So we could deduce it from the first one that using the ideal gas satisfying this law, that the H must be itself a function of, uh, of temperature. Well, as I say, you can prove it. You can prove it that from the, with, with the equation of state, uh, that uh, definitely H and U are a function of temperature. That is for certain. You can do that. Um, but uh, we have to wait for that. That is, is proven in the notes. A little bit tricky. You need the second law. Okay, so but as far as we're concerned, we're going to accept this experimental evidence and take the view that internal energy and enthalpy are indeed functions of temperature only. Uh, and let's allow, have a look at the significance of that. What what does it mean as far as uh, um, other, other properties are concerned? For instance, one of the other properties, well, specific 
heat capacity, of course, the one I'm thinking of. But um, of course, um, we know that. Um, well, as it may be telling us that the function of temperature is not telling us what it is. It doesn't tell me, as we said before, energy is invariably not measurable, not measurable. So we can't measure it. Um, all this is telling me is that you've got a gas law for an ideal gas. Uh, it's turning out that, uh, that it's restricting these things to be a function of one property only, not the two. Like our two property rule. We've essentially just broken our two property rule. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, it, as I say, it's a rule. <coughs> um, so there we go. Uh, but let's have a look at uh, specific heats then. Specific heat. It's specific heats, uh, CP and CV. Um, well, what we've got, well, let's have a look at the definition first. That we had our CP was equal to partial dH by dt. Walden uh, uh, pressure constant, that was our CP, and CV is equal to partially U by dt, Walden, uh, Walden V constant, volume, or specific volume uh, in that case. Uh, we've got an ideal gas, uh, and we've got that these are now only a function of temperature. So these partial derivatives. Uh, because H is a function of, uh, uh, put in brackets, ideal gas, we're, all, we're talking about ideal gas here. Uh, so we're talking about the ideal gas. For an ideal gas, we've discovered that H is a function of temperature only. So there's no point in having a partial derivative, but no pressure constant, to be honest. Uh, pressure doesn't, it doesn't have an effect. So this thing must become just an ordinary derivative, dH by dt. An ordinary derivative. Yes, it's irrelevant what pressure is doing for the ideal gas. It doesn't depend on it. That's what we found. And equally, exactly the same argument, uh, U is a function of uh, temperature only. That's what we've been told. Uh, this means that this is the U by dt, an ordinary derivative, which is a function of a single variable. When you've only got a single variable, it's ordinary differentiation. Uh, no fancy partial differentiation involved. Uh, well, we also know that H is equal to U plus PV. But we also know that PV is equal to RT. That's our gas law. This is the one we, we got to the most convenient form before. So that is equal to U plus RT. Uh, so the characteristic gas constant, remember, not the universal one. Uh, and consequently, it's telling me what I have to do next, differentiate with respect to T, yes? dH by dT by dT is equal to du by dT plus, well, differentiate RT, just get R. But dH by dT is equal to CP. And the U by the T is equal to CP. So CP, CP is equal to CV plus R, or R is equal to CP minus CV. Now the thing about this relationship is quite interesting um, because there's no reason to suggest that CP and CV are constants at all. They're generally a function of temperature, you know. H is a function of temperature. I differentiate it. It's still a function of temperature, this thing. Uh, so CP, so I could write it like this in more full form, I suppose, R. R is definitely not, definitely not a function of temperature. That's a constant. Uh, we've, we saw how to get here. We get the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass. That's that's not that's independent temperature at all. Uh, so Cp T minus Cv T. So what I'm saying is that okay, the Cp and Cv values invariably are a function of const uh, are a function of temperature. They're not constant. 
but the r itself is a constant so whatever happens these values the difference is always constant this is always quite interesting that you get this uh, relationship out between the uh, c p and c v values um, um, on uh, so that, that's quite a quite a useful result i i, I find uh, so a nice, and I, you find there's a difference there between always a difference for ideal gases. We see the difference between C P and C is R. Um, that is that is for sure. Uh, quite often you find in lots of the textbook we use gamma comes into it a lot. C P over C V. Uh, we in fact I did I did slightly quickly introduce gamma when I was looking at uh, polytropic processes. Uh, gamma P V to the gamma. Uh, equal to constant was one of the ones that I snuck in there as an uh, isentropic process, content entropy process. We haven't done it yet, but, but this comes up quite uh, quite often. Um, in uh, and, so, and sometimes you'll find that uh, because of that, um, you'll find that people will try to do, uh, define uh, things in terms of this ratio. So this relationship, for instance, you can divide through by uh, CV, for instance. Um, uh, so you could so you get R over CV uh, is equal to CP over CV is gamma uh, minus uh, minus one. Then if you so I divide through this by by CV, that was one gamma that, and then of course I could uh, just rearrange this, and that would give me that CV is equal to R R over gamma minus one. Um, so that that is a, that is a, um, uh, you know if you're using this ratio, I've done nothing fundamentally. I've just rewrote it using the ratio, uh, and also then since I've got CP over V is gamma, uh, then CP then uh, must be equal to gamma times CV. Take this to the top. That CV is that, so it's gamma. Ah, over gamma minus one. So this is just a way of using the uh, the ratio of specific heats. Uh, CP over CV in gases, we find that uh, there's a slightly different way of representing things. Uh, you get this this particular this particular relationship. Uh, gamma itself can be a function of temperature, of course. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that everything's constant here. R is constant, that's for sure. Um, so that that's one uh, could do it. So for, as far as our CP values and CV values are concerned, uh, what we can say about them is that the difference between them is definitely a constant. That's one thing we can say. Uh, and of course, they're a function of temperature uh, only. They're only a function of temperature for gases uh, because H and U are only a function of temperature. So that's a natural consequence uh, of that. Um, Okay, uh, whilst we're on about uh, polytropic processes, which we mentioned, so let's just rec let's have a look at that again. So polytropic processes. So polytropic, uh, we, we were looking at PV, PV, uh, PV to the N is equal to a constant, you might recall. PV to the N equals a constant. And different values of n give us different important processes. And when we looked at the work, uh, we came up with a formula. You might, be, might remember the formula. W1 uh, to 2 is equal to PV, P2, P2V2 minus P1V1 over 1 minus n. So that was for n not equal to 1. That we had to, had to be a little bit careful. Slightly different formula for uh, Using the natural logs, you might recall. Uh, let's just do this one. When n is equal to one, uh, well, things tend to simplify a little bit when you've got uh, 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 an ideal gas law, uh, because I think you can see that uh, if we've got an ideal gas we're, we're doing work on, then uh, I can re uh, one simplification would be that this is the work, the specific work, by the way. I've got a specific volume here. Uh, you have to divide through is for a closed system. Remember, you have to divide through by the mass. Um, if you if you want that as volume, then this becomes a big W. Okay, uh, so we've got this process, uh, but we've also got this. 
Uh, this is this is this the distinction between these two things you should understand. This is an equation of state. Uh, so at equilibrium uh, conditions, uh, these are the relationships that apply. Uh, when the thing settles down, this is what this is applying to. Uh, this is a, this is telling me about the process that I'm uh, I'm going through. So it might be isobaric, it might be isochoric, uh, isentropic, uh, isothermal, those type of things. This is telling me. Uh, as I move from one point on the state diagram uh, to another, what type of process I'm undergoing. Uh, this is these are the state relationships. This is the two property rule in force relating the state variables. Uh, that's what that's doing. So they add a, a distinction between the two. Okay, this simplifies. Omega one two uh, is equal to PV. Of course, is equal to RT. So I can write that as R T two minus T one over 1 minus n. So a little bit of a simplification goes on when you've got an idea of gas and you do work from that. Uh, you can use your gas law. Uh, no, the formula still works. I mean, there's no, you can just substitute in whenever you like. This is just doing that in one go. Uh, in fact, in fact, um, uh, you can mess about with this equation and try to get into a different form. Uh, it depends what information you know at your end states, to be honest. Uh, so quite often, and this is this is looking at this is saying okay, if I know PV at my end states, then this this type of equation then is great. Yes, it's, I don't need to do anything. But it may be that I know temperature. Uh, it may not, uh, or uh, uh, or maybe T and V or some other properties. You know. Um, so what you can do, you can generally rewrite this equation into different forms. As it turns out, uh, you can use this use this relationship. So PV, uh, for instance, PV to the N, uh, well, I could write that, what I can do, I can, one way to do it is to, I always try to form, form PV, this is how I uh, try to do it. So basically then, um, I could write, for instance, I can take a V out of this VN, why not, and stick it there. So I can make that PV uh, and then make this P, uh, V to the N minus 1, That's, that seems reasonable, yes. So I've got my PV there. That's equal to a constant. Um, uh, so I've just wrote this left hand side here and nothing's changed. But now I've got PV is RT. Uh, I can substitute RT in there, divide through by the R. Yeah, so that's equal to a constant. Uh, so substituting for the PV gives me RT going divide through by the R, so I'm going to get a different constant. We get that implies then that T to the V n minus 1 is equal to a constant. Different constant, in the middle of it, that doesn't matter. So that's another form of the same law. This is a polytropic process, but now dictated not by pressure V, but by temperature V, really, for instance. Um, so it's just a different way of writing the thing. Um, yeah. Uh, what else I could, uh, so that's, uh, um, I, I could try to get the P, oh, I see, yes, we could, we could make the PV into the N, I suppose, uh, so let's have a look at that. We've got uh, so this comes down again. What's well, another way of doing this? Um, yeah, okay. I can make that as p v to the n, um, and I've got p to minus oh p to the minus, one minus n. I think that's what we've got. Yes. <laughs> so p to the one minus n. The n's cancel. Kills off the p. Uh, it leaves me p v. So I've not changed anything. PV, I'm going to substitute in RT, so that's equal to constant, as we've done it, I've just rearranged it slightly. Substitute again, RT, divide by R to the N this time, on the other side, and we're going to get P to the 1 minus N, uh, T to the T to the, uh, T to the N, yes, yes, T to the N, equal to constant. Yeah, so there's a slightly different form where you've got P uh, and uh, P and uh, temperature, temperature, pressure, important. So again, it depends on the, uh, it's, it's no big deal, it's, it just depends on the end states. So one, one equation might be better than another one, depending on what you're after. Um, so, uh, and a particular polytropic process was, remember when, gamma, when N was equal to gamma, that was one of them. Uh, so, isentropic constant entropy we, we're going to do that uh, this ratio I snuck it in I think when I look at the work uh, 
uh, uh, didn't say where it was, but there it is now. And uh, for the polytropic processes, you can you can use your uh, your state equation to simplify things or make it convenient. Uh, depending on what information is at state one, state two, if it's temperature and V, then that, this one's the one you want. If it's pressure and temp, then that one's the one you want. If it's pressure and V, then the original is the one you want. So, uh, no problems uh, with that. Well, uh, anything else I need to cover? Um, it's more or less it, isn't it? Uh, uh, the only last thing I, could, I should mention is that uh, you can do mixtures. Well, I think in the notes you will find yeah, different equations of state, uh, particularly to deal with the uh, um, uh, to deal with around the point of the um, the critical point. These were this is where they were trying to apply these equations of state because it breaks down very much this equation when you go near there. Uh, I'm not going to be too concerned about that. Uh, we're going to focus on the uh, uh, on the ideal gas law. Um, the only other thing that I should, probably should mention is if you've got a mixture, um, well, if you've got a mixture, then you can still use your ideal gas for air, for instance, you can do it for air. Air, you could imagine, is 78% um, uh, nitrogen and 22% oxygen. So that's, that's a rough approximation. Uh, it's not quite that, but that is, uh, that's two th approximated air by. Uh, by two by two components, for instance, of gas, so oxygen and uh, nitrogen, and um, of course you you want to be able to apply uh, the gas law. And the only difference you have to do it's very straightforward, to be honest. Uh, so for a gas mixture, uh, the um, we we have our law, and I'll put it in this form now: PV equals N. Uh, RT. Uh, well, we've got that form. Or well, no, no. Let's uh, let's uh, let's not do that. We've got PV was MRT. Uh, uh, but what we want, of course, is that but R. If we want the characteristic constant uh, R, then uh, this is R over M. This is the molar mass. Uh, but when you've got a mixture, the question is, what is the molar mass? This is the thing. And what we do then is define it as the mean, uh, mean molar mass. So that's what we do when we've got a mixture. Uh, we want the the thing is we don't know the characteristic constant. The law still applies. It turns out it's just that you want to. Oh, you can apply this one because you've got the universal constant. So yeah, that's fine. Uh, but. Uh, uh, well, you still have to decide what the number of moles is, I guess, of your mixture, uh, which we can do. Uh, but for the, this particular one, what the characteristic constant, we have to define the mean molar mass. But it's fairly straightforward. Just, we just use the same formula we did before, um, that the, you know, it's in kilograms per mole, uh, the molar mass is just given by the mass divided by N. Uh, so that's how we, that's how we do it. Uh, so if you had a two component thing, uh, well, usually with two components, you'd have something like this. So the number of moles would be equal to the number of moles of one component or the number of moles of two components. So if I had air, and I was speaking of nitrogen and oxygen, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, I could, I, could, uh, I could specify what these things are. Uh, and mass, of course, is equal to the mass of, well, you can figure that as two components. Uh, that's that's for sure. Um, so what we, can we do? We can then uh, come to this equation, and um, we can substitute in. We can say, okay, m molar for this for our mean molar mass is the total mass, which is equal to m over n. So let's do that, and that's equal to m one plus uh, m two over n. I think that's 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 fine. Um, but of course, uh, the, the masses we can write as using the, more, the actual molar masses of the individual components. Uh, and again, it's essentially this form there, uh, where we can write this as N1 then times the big M1 plus N2 times the big N2 over N. And therefore, we can write this as N1 over N times the 
M1 plus N2 over N times the M2. So these are the molar masses for the components. Uh, so for oxygen, it's 32. For nitrogen, it's 24. Uh, I should check that. <laughs> uh, anyways, the uh, 28, is it? 28, yeah. Um, so you can put those numbers in. And um, and these things are the mole fractions, usually written as in Ys. I don't know why. <laughs> molar fractions. Molar fractions, and as I say, for our air, for instance, and we if we've got nitrogen, then we'd say y one is this is the nitrogen, then this would be uh, seventy eight percent, point seven point seven eight, uh, and for oxygen, this would be twenty percent of it, point two two. That would be the molar fraction. Essentially, they're telling you about the volume. Yes. Uh, anyways, this is just this, this to tell you that you can apply this theory to uh to um to mixtures as well i just want to make that point uh the the, the difficulty is is working out the characteristic constant but it turns out we can actually work it out uh with this definition uh of uh using the mean molar mass uh, and use the various components that we've got we can figure it out uh once we've got it then uh the mean molar mass we can uh, stick it in the. Uh, we know the. We know the R. Uh, we can work out the characteristic constant. It's very straightforward to work it out. So we can use uh, even the added gas loss for mixtures as well, as it turns out. Uh, but most of the stuff we're doing, admittedly, is uh, is for pure substances. Well, that's as I think is all I really want to say about gases. Um, very simple relationship. Uh, key points are and. Enthalpy and energy, internal energy, at the function of temperature. The differences uh, of the CP values, uh, specifically heat uh, values, CP minus CV was a constant equal to R, which was quite interesting um, uh, for this as a consequence of this thing. Um, and as I say later on, I'll, I'll we'll prove that uh, you can prove it that uh, because of the, the, the law you've got state equation, it, it does force the, uh, mathematically proof, the, um, that the energies are a function temperature only, which is quite important. Uh, as I said, there's this distinct, this difference between the CP values, you get CP minus CV is equal to R, the liquid essentially the same, there's no difference uh, when it comes to liquid, nothing really changes with pressure much, there's no real big volume change, that's why that doesn't, uh, but obviously for gases, that's not the case. Okay, I'll say goodbye there. Thank you very much. I'll see you next time.